Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be talking about the evidence-based management of lacrimal gland tumor today. I'm just going to pull up the Q&A, so um, I will try my very best to try to field some questions at the same time as giving this lecture. Um, so feel free to type uh, in your Q&A box as we go, and feel free to stop me. Um, a little introduction about myself. My name is Dr. Vivian Yin. I'm an oculoplastic and orbital oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, so, um, none of my financial disclosure is relevant for today. So for today, we're going to go over a little bit about the epidemiology and the basic um, background on, we're going to focus mostly on malignant um, tumors of the lacrimal gland. And then we'll go over a little bit about the treatment for lymphoma as well as epithelial tumor, the controversy over accentuation over globe sparing as well as intraarterial. And then we'll end the talk a little bit about what may be coming up on the horizon for treatment of lacrimal gland tumor. Now, some of these are still very early in their investigational phases, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about gene mutation and how we may try to use these at targeted therapy for future treatment of lacrimal gland gland tumors. So as a background, we know that lacrimal gland tumors are divided into epithelial and lymphoproliferative. As I mentioned before, I'm not going to talk about the benign um, inflammatory categories. Uh, within the epithelial, we tend to divide them into those that are malignant and benign. And, and roughly, I would say about half are benign. And of those, the most common is pleomorphic adenoma of the malignant adenocystic dominates and accounts for about 25% of all the epithelial tumors. Now you'll notice that based on the numbers and percentages, 25% missing because that's filled in by a little bit of everything else that's listed here. Among the lymphoproliferative disease of the lacrimal gland, mole lymphoma definitely dominates, and I would say they're about 75% or 70% of uh, lymphoproliferative disease of the lacrimal gland, and then followed by follicular or diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and we'll go over a little bit more into those as we go through the slides. So just to get you all thinking, um, we're going to start with a case. So this is a case of mine, 69-year-old female who had presented with the story of two months of bulging eyes. And I've given you two slices of the MRI here. One is a coronal on the top and an axial on the bottom. Now, if you were looking at these and trying to describe this lesion, a couple of terms may come to mind. One is that you can see on the coronal that the globe is displaced inferiorly. And you can see the enlargement of the lacrimal gland, especially if you compare it to the fellow side. So whenever you're looking at an imaging, I always say, if you don't know what you're looking at, just go side to side and see what looks abnormal. So this is the rough size of a normal lacrimal gland, whereas on the other side, you can see how it is much more prominent and the center of the globe is here, yet the center of the globe is slightly higher on the other side. Now, another term that may come to mind as you look at this on the, sorry, on the axial is that it molds around the globe and then also has a little till. We go, we'll go over those a little bit later on in terms of the significance of them. But looking at those two images, um, what would you like to do next for this patient? Would you like a excisional biopsy of the lacrimal gland, meaning you remove the entire gland and try to get a diagnosis? Would you like to do an incisional biopsy? Do you want a PET CT first? Do you want a bone marrow aspirate? Or none of the above, you have something else you would like to do first. So I'll give you guys a couple of more seconds to fill that out. And I know some of you may be thinking, um, one, of the uh, one of the questions that was posted on, um, uh, on the registration was a question about incisional versus excisional biopsy. We'll talk about that a little bit. So you can see here that I see most of the people want an incisional biopsy. There are some that wants excisional biopsy, and, and I'm glad to see that the differences are not huge because that allows me to talk a little bit about the controversy over incisional biopsy. So in this case, we did a incisional biopsy, and the reason is because I was suspicious of this being a lymphoma. 
And long and behold, the incisional biopsy shows these small blue cells you see on the left. And these, oh, I'm sorry, and these little glandular tissue, which are your lacrimal glands. And when you stain them for CD20, which is what the past slides are showing on the right, and CD20 is a stain for B cells. So as you can see on the import under, report underneath, it's positive or CD20, so it's telling us that this is a type of B cell lymphoma, and it's negative for CD5 and CD3, which are the markers for T cell. So this is consistent with a malt lymphoma, which, uh, as you know, is the most common lymphomatous um, disease of the lacrimal gland. So now that you know the diagnosis is a malt lymphoma, what do you think is the appropriate next step? Would you like a complete excision and possibly with frozen section or margin control? Or would you like to initiate induction chemotherapy followed by maintenance? Uh, would you like a PET CT first? Would you like to do a CSF TAF or flow cytometry? Or none of the above? Okay, so it looks like it's split <laughs> equally between complete excision and in initiation of induction chemotherapy. Um, now, this is a little bit of a trick question um, because I didn't tell you um, besides the orbit, was there any other systemic involvement? So the correct answer is actually a PET-CT. And the reason that that has to be the first step is because we do not treat lymphomatous disease with um, um, surgical excision. Instead, the treatment is either radiation if it's limited to the orbit or if it's involving the systemic um, um, system, then you consider chemotherapy. And with mold lymphoma, sometimes you don't even, if there's low burden of disease in the rest of the body, you actually can observe those instead of treating with chemotherapy. So like I mentioned, orbital lymphoma is predominantly mold, which constitute about half or just over a half. Now, depending on which literature you look at, there may be a split between what is the second most common. So it could be either follicular in some studies in some region of the world, or it can be diffuse large B cell lymphoma as the predominant one. Now, this is a American-based journal that says that diffuse large B cell for North American population is a little bit more common than follicular, but I can tell you in my practice, I see the two sometimes being almost exactly the same. And then you have a small percentage of mental cell. I didn't put a percentage of NKT cells because it's relatively rare and we don't really know the exact incidence of um, that contributing to orbital lymphoma. But one of the things that is unique about NKT cell is that they are very um, um, chemo resistant. So you treat them in a different fashion than the rest of the lymphomatous uh, conditions. Now these typically present as a painless mass. To have bony erosion on imaging is quite uncommon. Uh, there is a small percentage though that can present with bilateral. So if you see a patient with bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement, that doesn't rule out orbital lymphoma. Um, it just makes it a little bit less likely. And lymphomas are quite common in the orbit and accounts for 20% of all orbital masses. So this is not 20% of malignant lacrimal gland tumor, but this is all orbital masses, 20% approximately as orbital lymphoma, which is a big chunk. And only about half of them actually involves lacrimal gland. The other can have either systemic involvement or present as a plasma cytoma or present as a discrete mass within the orbit. And the treatment, as I mentioned, for orbital lymphoma alone, so isolated orbital involvement, either it's lacrimal gland or non-lacrimal gland, is actually radiation. And most recently, there's been a push to actually um, decrease the dosage of radiation. Um, as we know, radiation causes a lot of ocular side effect, and this is an attempt to decrease the um, the uh, uh, side effects profile to the globe. Now, I noticed someone had raised their hand. I'm going to encourage you to actually uh, type in the Q&A instead, as we're not able to hand over the mic uh, to um, the participants. Um, now, with ultra low dose, what we mean by that is actually eight gray in total of radiation. And you may remember back in the days from medical school or from residency that the amount of radiation required to induce a cataract is roughly 10. So this is even less than the dose required to induce a cataract. 
and they give it in two fractions, so you're getting it two consecutive day, two gray on each day. And this has shown a quite a good response um, in one study uh, showing that the overall response rate of complete regression or complete response of as high as 86%. Now that is very impressive when we're talking about the world of oncology. And then partial response, meaning that you may have shrinkage of the lacrimal gland size, but you can still see slight enlargement or slight fuzziness around the edges showing maybe there is some residual disease, about 14%. Now, like I mentioned, mold lymphoma sometimes with systemic involvement, medical oncologists will even say to observe because these tend not to be fatal and they tend not to cause um, morbidity or mortality for the patient. Now, Thien is asking, do we need to take biopsy on both sides if it's bilateral, if we're suspicious for lymphoma? And the answer is no, we don't need to biopsy both sides. Now, with that being said, there are situations where I may biopsy both sides if I go to one side and find that um, I'm not getting a good yield or the gland looks largely normal and I think that I'm not going to get a good result that sometimes we will go to the second side in order to get the diagnostic uh, results that we want. Um, so, so the strict answer is no, we don't need to go to both sides. Uh, I usually go after the one that is larger, um, assuming that there's more disease there uh, for a definitive diagnosis. So what about this patient uh, who is a 53-year-old lady uh, presented to me with just swelling of the upper lid? And she says that she's had headache for three days. Because of the headache, she received a CT scan in the emergency room. And you can see here the coronal and the, act and the sagittal presented on the right for you. Now, one of the things you may notice is that if you look very carefully, the bone seems to be missing here or there's something going on there. The mass is a lacrimal gland mass, but it seems to go beyond the lacrimal gland and even into potentially the extradural intracranial component. And you can see even more clearly on the sagittal, kind of have this ring enhancement and it doesn't look like the last one or cleanly where it's just lacrimal gland involvement. So it looks a little bit different than the last one, but in the same um, vicinity. Now this was a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. These are very, uh, very common to have systemic uh, involvement. So unlike mole, which there's a low risk, about 30, 15 to 30% risk of systemic involvement, these actually are much higher and pushing 50 to 60%. They tend to be more aggressive and more rapidly growing, and they can be associated with visual loss because of compressive uh, mechanism on the optic nerve. So you, show, you saw the previous malt lymphoma where it was so big that it was causing displacement on the globe, but even then the patient has zero visual uh, symptom, meaning that no visual loss, no color vision, no optic neuropathy. Uh, but with these ones, even if they're not um, significantly large in size, they can, depending on the location, they are cause visual loss. And these, however, the good news is is very, very chemosensitive. And they are radial sensitive as well, uh, maybe a little less so than um, mold lymphoma. So these we tend not to treat with um, low dose radiation if we're going to radiate the orbit, but these are exquisitely chemosensitive. And because of that, we tend to recommend chemotherapy first if there's any systemic involvement at all. Um, and I listed here for you some of the common regimen. Now, the next question I know people are going to ask me is, which regimen do you use in terms of chemotherapy? And my answer is it really depends on the region and depends on the degree of systemic involvement. So CHOP tends to be kind of the first go-to as first line for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. However, if there's significant systemic involvement, then our CHOP tends to be the first line for most people in most centers. So check with your local medical oncologist in terms of locally what is the most uh, preferred first line therapy. Now, I mentioned that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma can cause optic neuropathy, and here's an example now. This is not a case of lacrimal gland, but I think it's important for you to recognize the difference between diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and mold lymphoma and how, how distinctly different the two are. So this was a patient that had a mass wrapped around her optic nerve, as you can see here. Um, the nerve is not displaced, but rather encased and on the axial, you can see that it's definitely not the nerve itself that's involved, but rather something around the substance of the nerve itself. And on the 
optic nerve imaging on the right there, you can see that you're already seeing some subtle pallor uh, on the left side, which is the top photos there compared to the normal side. So this is an example of a patient who actually presented with NLP vision solely from this mass um, that is involved. Now, this patient does have systemic involvement and in, in, uh, had received chemotherapy, RCHOP specifically, and the orbit component did not respond, so they had to go on to second-line chemotherapy in order to try to get orbital response. And any questions so far? If not, I'm going to move and switch gear a little bit to talk about epithelial tumor of the lacrimal gland. Um, this is probably what most of the excitement around lacrimal gland evolved because of the new um, targeted therapy that is available on the market, as well as now that we're understanding more and more about cancer genomics and its influence on malignancy as well as um, its influence on metastasis. So by and large, in terms of epithelial tumor, we say about half of them are malignant and half of them are benign. The true number is a little bit less clean cut like this. So in some area of the world, you're seeing a little bit more benign where it's a 60-30 split. And in other, you're seeing a little bit more malignant tumor and malignant is 60% and benign is 30%. But I think thinking about it as roughly 50-50 is still a good rule of thumb. And of the malignant, we typically talk about adenocystic and benign pleomorphic. I'm not going to go into too, too much detail about, um, you know, the other malignant mix as well as mucoepithelioid just for the sake of time so we can have some time to talk about the exciting part about genetics of epithelial tumors. So a little bit of background of adenocystic. We know that 20 to 35% of all lacrimal tumor are adenocystic. So now you're seeing, remember how lymphoma, I said 20% of all orbital tumor. So this is only 20% of all lacrimal tumor. So this is definitely less common than uh, lymphoma in the orbit. Um, they tend to have more early PNI, PNI meaning perineural invasion. There's a high risk of recurrence with anocystic and high risk of mortality. Now in textbook, people tend to say 50%, but in some of the new um, treatment modality or new literature are coming out with, um, with survival of pushing 80%. And we'll talk a little bit later on when we go through the specific details of those study, why we think that may be uh, and whether that is uh, generalizable to the whole world or not. In terms of subtype of adenocystic, we know there's cribriform um, and there's solid. And sometimes you'll see terms like sclerosing, um, tubular. Now, by and large, I think clinically speaking, we tend to care about two patterns specifically, which is the cribriform, cribriform plate, uh, cribriform uh, form, which is the most common, and it's the one that is considered a little bit more um, good in terms of prognosis. And the solid, which is also called basaloid, is the one that we worry about a little bit more since there's some study suggesting that it's the form that tend to recur or the form that tends to metastasize. Now, here's an example of those two um, forms that I mentioned. So this was a 24-year-old patient of mine who presented actually with ptosis. Um, and she says she has some intermittent sharp uh, pain. And you can see on the fundus photograph, you may be able to, sorry, the, the um, facial photograph, you may be able to see some fullness in the subbrow area. She's pharmacologically dilated, so that is not a blown pupil. And on the CT scan, uh, I give you two coronal only because there are specific characters that I wanted you to pick out. Um, you can see that there may be some deficit in bone in the upper photos here. So you can only judge bony defect on CT. You can see this mass is also pushing the globe down, but it's not indenting the globe. And it's kind of have these kind of scalloped edges, as I like to call them, where it's not so clean cut. You can't really tell where the muscle ends, where the tumor begins. So this is one of the patients that had um, cribriform um, subtype of um, anocystic carcinoma. Now, there was a question that um, is coming in asking, are traditional clinical and radiological feature enough to differentiate uh, pleomorphic adenoma from adenocystic? So I'm guessing that the question that um, Kubra is asking is, can I tell whether it's pleomorphic or adenocystic based on a clinical exam, 
and based on, let's say, a CT or an MRI alone? And the answer is not always. There are some features that are uh, useful to know. So I, I'm trying to point out some of them as we go along. So like I mentioned, if you see breaks in bone like this patient where there is um, very high suspicion of potentially a bony defect, these tend to be anocystic rather than pleomorphic. The other thing is we'll talk about some of the signs of anocystic that you may try to pick up on imaging. So the fact that I say these edges looks a little fluffy, so this may be you know, part of the tumor since we can still see the muscles here. And we can't really tell the muscle and it sort of had these fluffy edges. So those tend to be things that we look for to tell us that it may be anocystic. Pleomorphic seems tends to be more well circumscribed. So it's, it's a clear circle, a clear oval. The edges are sharp and distinct and they tend to have molding, meaning that the bone may have changes where it thins out, but it doesn't have a break in them. And the bone is smooth, it's not scallop or moth eaten. Um, with that being said, though, I would say there is a portion of patient that you may not be able to tell, and, and you may have to just assume you don't know, and, and that's the patients that you tend to do an incisional biopsy on. And um, while we're on the topic, because I know one of the questions that was sent in through the registration was, should you do an incisional biopsy on lacrimal gland tumor? And the answer is, if you are not sure, you should. So let's say that the imaging and the clinical exam is ambiguous and you really are not 100% sure whether this is adenocystic or pleomorphic and the tumor is really big and you're worried about um, potential posterior extension to the apex and potential vision loss just from your surgery alone. I would say in those cases, um, I would say that you will need to do an incisional biopsy in order to consent the patient properly. Um, now, the question becomes, well, what about recurrence rate for pleomorphic adenoma? So yes, there is um, a high risk for recurrence with pleomorphic adenoma, and when they recur, they tend to be multifocal, meaning that um, what you end up doing is these little foci that is left behind that regrow, which makes it a lot harder to go back and clean it up completely. And I have seen multiple recurrent pleomorphic adenoma that gets sent in to us in the end that is incredibly hard to clean out perfectly. But I think the risk of what people are worried about is truly malignant transformation. I think most of us who treat a lot of lacrimal tumor uh, would agree that malignant transformation does exist, but I think they're not as high as what we are we used to believe in. I think the transformation probably is somewhere around 15% to 20%. Um, and some of the literature are starting to suggest that. The problem is we don't have good uh, prospective or retrospective study to tell us the exact incidence of malignant transformation, but I think the risk is probably relatively low. And the risk of malignant transformation is not dependent on whether you did an incisional biopsy or not. Uh, and this is, I don't have any evidence to prove that, but this is anecdotally what we see. Um, whereas recurrence is um, much more tied to whether you have removed things completely or not. Now there's one more question about the use of fine needle uh, biopsy for pre or intraoperative. Um, I'm not sure why the question is intraoperative, um, but fine needle aspirates or biopsy for diagnosis. So there has been attempts at biopsying um, the lacrimal gland without an incisional biopsy. Um, most of us tend to move away from that for two reasons. One is that you don't get as good of a sample um, and you may end up go, needing to go in for incisional biopsy anyways. The other risk that is always in the back of our mind is the risk of a orbital hemorrhage. So these um, anocystic or pleomorphic are highly vascularized. And if you don't have an incisional biopsy, you can't really obtain hemostasis. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a dilemma. And I think for me, the biggest reason um, I am not a huge proponent for fine needle biopsy is really because of, uh, of um, diagnostic uh, yield where there's still, I would say, 30% of the time where you you need to do an incisional biopsy anyways. And these, you can be, uh, you can do them through relatively small incisions. So I use, a, you know, five millimeter to seven millimeter incision in the liquorice to do these biopsy to get good uh, specimens. Um, and those heal really well. So you really don't have any reasons not to, in essence, to do just an incisional biopsy. So here 
is a contrast of the previous patient. This is a 46-year-old female who presented with proptosis for about two months, and you see that clinical photo, there's some displacement. You can sort of see some chemosis, and on the MRI to your right there, you can see a large mass that's occupying, I would say, half, if not more than half of the orbit. And you can see that it's very indistinct. So you kind of see this little tail. And this tail is very important because this is probably the most telltale sign of adenocystic carcinoma. So if you see something like this, this is definitely not a pleomorphic adenoma. Um, and you can sort of see that it's, it's quite large. It's occupying the entire lateral orbit. There's... It's pretty rare for or lacrimal tumor to cause displacement of the optic nerve. So these patients tend to have relatively good vision at presentation. And this is an example to you of a basaloid or, or solid uh, adenocystic carcinoma. You can see that it's very, very uh, blue. So when I'm teaching my residents and pathology is always something that is really hard for them. I try to simplify to say just, is there a lot of blue or is there a lot of pink? And a lot of blue means that there's lots of cells there because those are the nucleus. Uh, and if there's lots of pink, and those are usually the extracellular matrix or scar. So this is definitely a, a highly cellular uh, pathology. Um, and that's what solid is trying to describe or basaloid, basaloid meaning blue, uh, meaning lots of blue on the slides. So Moving on to a little bit about pleomorphic. Now, they are about 50% of all lacrimal epithelial tumor. They're way more common than anocystic. Um, the old school data say that there's risk of transformation of 10% at 20 years and 20% at 30 years. Um, I'm not sure if that is, is true anymore based on what we know today. Um, recurrence, though, I do agree with. So I would say the recurrence is probably higher than what's reported in these uh, numbers that we have from uh, old literature, meaning literature that's greater than 20 years. Um, that recurrence can uh, occur in 3% of what is presumed to be complete excision. And then with incomplete excision, the recurrences are a lot higher. Now, I would say... 30% is probably correct in terms of incomplete excision. Now, the, the question of complete excision is, is uh, I think what this number is telling us is that even if you, um, at the time of surgery, think you've gotten complete excision, if pathologically is close to the capsule, then you have to assume that it's not. And then the question becomes complex in terms of do you go back in and clean things out more, or do you do frozen section at the time of surgery? Um, the strict answer to that is we don't really know, um, and it's really dependent on um, the person that is treating this physician, what they're comfortable with. And no, what by incomplete excision, I don't mean incisional biopsy. Um, that is separate from incisional biopsy. So I would say with pleomorphic adenoma, one of the downside of having done an incisional biopsy, let's say you just really didn't know um, at the time of seeing this patient, whether it's pleomorphic anacystic, what I tend to advocate for if you're going back to do a complete excision is that you have to do a bigger incision. You have to excise out basically your previous incisional scar for its entire depth um, and remove, you know, any area that you have touched, quote unquote, before in order to make sure that you truly had gone around any potential for seeding. So a lot of the uh, argument against incisional biopsy, and interesting enough, I was just at a conference for orbital oncology, and this was even among experts who treats cancer only, um, a, a discussion point where people were arguing about what is uh, what should be done. Um, so I think the, the take home message or the key point about this is that if you did you know, did an incisional biopsy. It's not the end of the world, but you do have to consider anything you've touched from the first surgery as dirty. And if you weren't the first one to do an incisional biopsy and then you see this patient, then you have to assume that anything that you your incision um, ends up being bigger and the reconstruction ends up being bigger. So this is an example of a patient with pleomorphic adenoma. This is a relatively young gentleman who you can see has significant displacement of the globe and fullness in the sub uh, subbrow or uh, superior temporal aspect of the orbit. Now you can see that the, the imaging here shows you something completely different. So very well circumscribed. These tend to be very firm even when you're cutting it out and it can indent the globe um, significantly in, uh, in the imaging, which also is a bit of a telltale sign of being pleomorphic. Uh, 
Now, even on higher up, it's still showing a very distinct, well circumference, very clear cut. Now, one other question is when you look on the corona, well, Dr. Yin, you said that this is a little fluffy, so how do you know this is not an anocystic? And this is one of the commonest questions I, when residents present cases to me, residents or fellow, that they often and will hang up on one image and say, well, but this proves you wrong. This has to be an anocystic because on the coronal, it looks a little fluffy. And then this is when I tell them, you have to put the whole picture together. So we never know for certain, and I always say tissue is king, meaning that until you actually get these tissue on a slide, you never know 100%, there's always surprises. But you have to use your best judgment, and best judgment is based on all your story put together. So the clinical story of how long this has been going on and even looking at patients old photos looking at all the images and putting it all together instead of getting hung up on one image alone because um, there is always artifact there's motion artifact maybe the patient moved a little bit in that one slice so you put the whole picture together the two out of three of the images it's telling you this is pleomorphic only one is suspicious for adenocystic this is a patient that i will actually remove the entire gland assuming that this is a pleomorphic adenoma and they look very differently than the two previous uh, pathology I've shown you where now you see a lot of pink scenario. So this is a very, what we call blend looking. So not a lot of cell. These little blue dots are the cells only. It's predominantly pink. You can still see preserved glandular architecture. The epithelium around the gland looks nice and thin and normal. So this is a benign uh, tumor of the lacrimal gland. So in terms of anesthetic carcinoma, um, a big series out of Moorfields looked at their um, survival looking all the way back to 1972 uh, up to 2014 and showed that survival is still relatively poor with uh, malignant epithelial gland tumors at only about 50% uh, at 10 years and about 60% at five years. Um, why is it that their, show, their latest series is showing a lower survival rate compared to some of the quote-unquote glow-sparing surgery you may be seeing uh, coming out of North America. Now, we don't really know, but my, my suspicion and my guess is that this patient data, so let's say from 72 up to 2000s, patient was treated very differently, patient may have presented later, our technique, our radiation and chemotherapy may not be the same, so you do have to take it with a grain of salt that these 50% is still what I quote to patients, but in my mind, I think the true survival or prognosis for patient is a little bit higher than this. Now, a little bit about imaging. So besides CT and MRI, is there something else we can use to help us distinguish um, the different lacrimal gland tumor to help guide us in terms of what do we tell patients? Um, there is some interest in ultrasound, and, and I have to say uh, that I haven't used ultrasound as widely as some other people do, but I think it's very interesting to know that for some of you who have difficult access to MRI or CT scan, that this may be a technique that you want to develop or get good at. Uh, one caveat is that ultrasounds are very technician dependent, meaning that you have to train a very good technician and be consistent with the technician in order to get good yield of your um, ultrasound result. So, you know, sometimes I'm lucky to have a very good ultrasound technician who gives me beautiful photos and give me very diagnostic um, pictures, but sometimes that they are completely off the mark um, and it's really depending on who's doing the ultrasound that day. And there's some suggestion to think that at least for distinguishing epithelial versus non-epithelial tumors of the lacrimal gland and that the lymphoid proliferative disease tend to have a more preserved vascular architecture. And that's what the septae and the vas three true vascularization is talking about, is that you see these nice stack horn that looks like blood vessels. And this is a color doppler, so they show you arterial flow as well as venous flow. Whereas with epithelial, there's more disruption of the natural vascular architecture where you see these blobs that doesn't really look like blood vessels. Um, and those tend to be more epithelial tumors. Now you're gonna ask me, well, you tell me epithelial and non-epithelial, you then tell me malignant or benign, and that's exactly the point that these ultrasounds still does not tell you or does not have um, enough um, evidence to show whether they can um, accurately distinguish between malignant versus benign. In this paper, they did try to talk about um, 
using combination of all the factor that is listed there, meaning resistant, hypoacogeneity, septate entry, shave vascularization in order to try to figure out can you subcategorize the epithelial into malignant or not and the non-epithelial into malignant or not. But I think the data is a little bit softer in that aspect versus just distinguishing between lymphoproliferative versus epithelial tumor. So hopefully as we get more experience with this that we can have better characterization of how to use uh, ultrasound and potential co color doppler with the ultrasound. Now, this is a correlation to tell you that this is the patient that they are showing these um, lymphoproliferative uh, changes on and epithelial changes on. And I will argue that even just looking even at this MRI, I don't really need an ultrasound to tell me that this is not likely to be a pleomorphic adenoma. So um, kind of shows you that ultrasound's great, but I think we still don't really quite know how to use it in addition to our imaging technology that we have available to us right now. So what is available to us is CT and MRI that we do have lots of experiences with. And as I alluded to earlier, that there is this posterior extension or this kind of tail, as I call it, in the back. And this has been beautifully talked about actually in a paper by Jeff Rose and the Morfield group, and they termed it the wedge sign. And they were able to show that the wedge sign is something that is quite distinct um, and accurate in telling you whether this is potentially a adenocystic rather than a pleomorphic adenoma. Now, how useful is the wedge sign in distinguishing lymphoma versus adenocystic? Not as useful. So lots of lymphoma patients of mine actually do have this wedge or tail sign. But what I think is useful to know that the wedge sign is correlated with carcinoma um, relatively well. So if you see that, you can go ahead and, and not worry about this being a pleomorphic adenoma. Some of the other characters that we talked about is bony erosion or excavation. Um, so excavation meaning, or the other word for it is remodeling. Um, so excavation meaning that it didn't eat through bone, rather it remodeled bone. Whereas erosion is also, um, um, can be think about as actually uh, eating through bone or actually um, involving the bone itself. Um, calcification has been pointed out in several studies to be correlated with anocystic carcinoma. Molding to the gobe is a classic word that is used to describe lymphomatous lesion of the lacrimal gland. But I will have to say that anocystic carcinoma also has a tendency to do that. So that's not, um, even though textbook tells us that tend to be in the indicative of lymphomatous proliferation of the lacrimal gland, I would say that can also happen with epithelial tumors of the lacrimal gland. So with all of that information, um, now we're going to move on a little bit to treatment. So let's ask the audience, which of the following treatment modality for adenocystic carcinoma, or let's generalize it to and say epithelial malignant lacrimal glands, which of the following do you think will improve survival? Is exenteration or cranial orbital resection meaning you not only remove all orbital contents, but you also remove bone in addition to it. The story of no prior biopsy, predominant basodoy histology or solid histology, the use of adjuvant chemotherapy or none of the above. So I'm glad that I'm seeing kind of, oh, there's more and more people thinking adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, so, this is very interesting because I, I was expecting you guys to tell me that exenteration is the thing that has shown to improve survival. I was not expecting that many people to pick adjuvant chemotherapy, but I can kind of understand where rationale is coming from. Um, so, and the reason I'm posting this question as such is because this is the biggest thing we talk about. So this was a beautiful study out of more fields that was recently published that finally we have a good study to show us that exenteration, which is this line right here, actually does not have any prediction compared to globe sparing surgery and radiation, which is this top line here. Now, are you going to interpret this as globe sparing does better than exenteration? I would not really do that. Rather, I would just say these two are statistically not significant, so they're equivalent. 
But interesting enough, the patient who got cranial orbital resection, which is a line on the bottom, actually did worse. Now, is this because um, cranial orbital resection is bad for the patient? Um, and it causes patient to have higher mortality. I wouldn't draw that conclusion, but rather I think the patient who ended up with cranial orbital recession are from an eight older series probably, as this is a large series all the way from 72. Um, so what this study I would draw out from it is that survival is equivalent whether you get an exenteration or not. Uh, so one study that looked at the correlation between residual tumor, they classified it as R0 or 1 together versus R2. R0 is R1 is an AGCC way of um, categorizing how much residual tumor. And we talk about gross residual, meaning that you know at the time of surgery that you can physically see tumor left behind, versus microscopic residual, meaning at the time of surgery, you thought you'd taken it all, but in the end, the pathology shows that there is actually still tumor left behind or uh, tumor extend to margin, so you're assuming there's tumor left behind, versus R2, which is that you just, you can see that you didn't take it all. Um, and that when you have gross residual tumor, that the survival was worse than those who had just microscopic residual. And this is kind of intuitive for most of us who treat cancer. And also intracranial extension, it's kind of intuitive that if there is intracranial extension, that we are gonna assume that survival is worse since we can't get complete surgical excision in that sense. So in essence, you're having gross residual. So it's kind of intuitive to think that these two will have worse prognosis compared to those who don't. Um, but it's nice to see a study that actually shows this to us. And then the other thing that does show worse that I, uh, survival that I alluded to earlier is the basaloid subtype or the solid subtype. Whether it's because these behave a little bit like morpheiform where it's hard for us to get complete excision and there's more left behind or not, we don't really know. Now, there's a debate over the predictive factor of T staging. So most of the North American study has shown that T2 and below versus T3 and above is kind of a cutoff point for us to know um, or prognosticate survival for this patient. So those who are T3 and less did a lot worse and was around the 50th percentile uh, in terms of overall survival at five years, whereas T2 and below tend to be hovering around the 80% survival, maybe even 90% survival in some of the North American studies. However, in European study by Morfields, they did not see that distinction. And some of the other studies that I'm seeing coming out of other countries also couldn't find that distinction between this T staging being uh, prognosticating. So I think um, we're seeing a bit of a split there and we're, do we're not sure at this point why some studies are showing significance of T-staging whereas others are not. So what about innovative treatment modality? I think that's what most people are most excited about and we're going a little bit over time but I hope you'll bear with me. So I would say that before we even talk about this you have to first think about why are we innovating? So the goal of innovation should be not only improvement in mortality, but more importantly for us as ophthalmologists, we care about saving the eyeball. So we wanna preserve sight as much as we, as we can. But one thing sometimes as physicians we forget to think about is the quality of life for the patient. So even if I can say, let's say improve or extend the patients by one year of life, um, you have to think about how much um, um, you're impacting the patient's quality of life. So if that improvement of one year of life is a trade-off of being hospitalized for six months, is that really still worth it for the patient? So I will caution people who are trying to push the boundary of what we're doing in terms of treatment to also think about balancing those three factors so that you are truly designing an innovation that is good for the patient. So one of the most exciting thing I would say for the past 10 year is a number of studies coming out looking at globe sparing surgery. Um, now Dr. Ismaili is probably the first one at MD Anderson to start treating patients in this manner and had very good results in sort of survival uh, with it being at least equivalent to exenteration. And what do we mean by glow stirring? We, does, we don't mean you do a partial excision of the tumor. We mean that you just don't do an exenteration, but you still do a big surgery to make sure that you uh, do a proper lateral orbitotomy and remove the cancer on block with the purpose of reaching no residual tumor and then followed by adjuvant radiation. 
Now, in her series, uh, which the latest uh, publication actually combined her results with those from Korea with Dr. Kim's series, and this is probably the largest series that is so far today published on the outcome of these patients, and they actually showed that the, the patient has really good survival at around 80%. There is local recurrence, as you can see in the chart on the bottom, with if there is gross residual, as we mentioned. So this kind of confirms some of the other study looking at prognosticator for recurrences, that if you do have gross residual, the recurrence rate is really high. Um, whereas no or microscopic residual, the local recurrence drops to you know, around 15%. Now, in terms of survival, you can see that the disease-free survival, which is the one we probably care about the most, uh, meaning that not only do patients live, but they don't have any recurrences, is around 72%, so that's great. But even more impressive is the overall survival. You see that we're now pushing 90%. Now, this is a disease, remember, that we used to say 50% of the patient are going to die at five years. And now we're showing 90% or, or greater than 85% surviving past five years. So this is really, really great to know. Now, what does RFS mean? RFS means recurrence-free survival. So meaning that this is even more specific than disease-free survival because disease-free survival encompasses those who has recurrence as well as who know uh, we left disease behind. So they never was cure of disease or they would never have complete response in essence. So this is even more specific to just people may have had no disease after surgery and radiation, then had a new full site of disease. It's around 45%. And one last thing is that in 90% of this, the patient had eye preservation. Why is that not 100%? Um, it's not 100% because this is a study that looked at um, the final outcome. So let's say if patient had recur in this category or this group of the patient, then they may have gotten the exenteration as a rescue therapy. Um, and so that's why some of these patients did end up getting uh, exenteration. Now, one of the concerns when this study was first getting designed is the risk of radiation to the eye. So a lot of radiation oncologists, even some of those that I work with at first, may be resistant to radiating a orbit that has a globe there with high dose. And part of the reason is because they're worried that they're going to cause permanent damage to the eye and you end up losing the eye as well. Now, with um, now, I think this strategy of keeping the eye in and radiating is possible because our radiation technology has also improved. So I would say 50 years ago, we probably wouldn't be able to save the eye if we had radiated with the eye in the socket. But now with all of our IMRT, IMPT, and all the stereostatic radiation that we have available to us, we are able to achieve a radiation field that minimizes damage or minimize the amount of radiation that we are given to the eye. So um, if you look at some of the uh, more recent study in terms of side effect to the eye, um, we are noticing that dry eye is by and large pretty universal, but you can see that retinopathy has dropped significantly. Um, the need for enucleation is very rare in terms of um, a globe that is painful and blind that needs to be removed. And more than 68% of the patient has final vision that is even better than 2040. One of the other things to remember out of this is that a lot of patients would rather have their eye in even if it doesn't see versus having a exenteration. So even though only 60% or 68% or 70% of patients are getting more than 2040, patient, uh, 2040 vision, there's a greater number of patients who are happy, even if they're not seeing as good as 2040 or not having a functioning eye, to just have a cosmetically pleasing and symmetrical eye in their socket. Now, what about specific to the cornea? Because I would say cornea side effect is what leads to enucleation uh, or lead to a non-functioning eye in a lot of these patients. Risk of optic neuropathy is actually relatively low with radiation. And most of the time, because we're radiating the lateral quadrant of the eye only, even if you have radiation retinopathy, for that to impact your central vision has been um, low. So really, the biggest side effect that we're worried about is actually cornea. So corneal perforation is only about 13% of these patients. Um, 
although acute keratal conjunctivitis, meaning dry eye, painful eye, uh, conjunctivitis is actually quite common. And in my patient, I tend to tell them actually it's universal. So usually when I'm counseling a patient who's about to undergo radiation, I tell them to expect it and to, to if they don't have it, it's rare. What about intraarterial chemotherapy? So the debate between globe sparing alone versus intraarterial has been ongoing. And I would say the, the big group driving intraarterial chemotherapy is a group from Baskin and Calmer, driven by Dr. C. And at first, he had designed his trial actually with intraarterial, following by exenteration, following by systemic chemotherapy with radiation, following by systemic chemotherapy. So I think I'm belaboring this, the design of their study because I think a lot of people assume that intraarterial chemotherapy means you do intraarterial and that's it, you're done. But that is actually not what his study was designed to do. His study was designed to actually improve survival. In, in one essence, I sort of use this term that he basically threw the garden sink at the patient. So he used everything we possibly have to try to increase that survival from 50% um, that we have historically to greater. And if you look at his study, he then subdivided in his second um, paper on this protocol to two groups. I'm going to focus on the overall one first because the separation between group one and group two is slightly artificial and retrospective in nature. So the study was not designed on the get-go to say there is a group one and there's a group two, but rather after the completion of the study, he went back and looked at the data and tried to parse out two groups to figure out which group did better. Um, as an epidemiologist and as a scientist, we always put a lot of caution on people and trying to reparse data because you're building in inherent biases. So I'm not saying the study is not valid. I'm just saying just take it with a grain of salt in terms of uh, how much we believe in the study. However, you can trust the overall. So the overall, he did improve survival where 84% of the pa patients are not alive at five years compared to 50%. So I would say intraarterial chemotherapy has been able to achieve in his protocol as high of a survival as the globe searing series out of MD Anderson. However, you have to remember these patients had exenteration and had systemic chemotherapy and had radiation onto the free flap. So once again, just kind of belaboring the point that this is a significant improvement compared to what's conventional and the conventional meaning exenteration. Um, and then um, these two line is them parsing out um, whether patient actually follows strict protocol or not. As I mentioned, the protocol is quite hard. So they had a lot of patients falling off protocol because of intolerance to chemotherapy or intolerance to radiation. Just to get you guys started um, about lacrimal gland epithelial tumor and the genetics of it, I'm going to start off with a question. So the question is whether you think the genetic profile, genetic mutational profile of lacrimal gland epithelial tumor, namely adenocystic, malignant mix, is the same as parotid gland tumor. Is this true or false? So it looks like we're kind of split on this. So approximately half of you think it's true, half of you think it's false. So the old school thought is that parotid gland tumor is similar to adenocystic tumor. However, um, the clinician who treats this a lot, namely the orbital surgeons, uh, we tend to think that they, they behave a little bit different than parotid gland tumors. There are some similarity, but there are some differences. And it was reassuring to see a nice studies from a pathology group looking at microRNA expression and showed that there is actually difference between lacrimal gland versus parotid gland tumor. So you can see the clustering here with the blue on the bottom. These are the lacrimal gland tumor. The yellows are salivary gland tumor and the greens are breast. So you can get anocytic carcinoma in the breast as well. So you can see how the breast cluster to one end, the salivary gland cluster to another, and it's nice to see this nice clustering of the lacrimal gland tumor. So it's showing us that even though there is overlap, that there is still something different about the lacrimal gland anocystic uh, carcinoma compared to the others. And there is some MRNA uh, differences that there's 
um, specific mRNA, uh, namely two, that is upregulated in these lacrimal gland tumor. The black ones are the downregulated ones. Now you're going to ask me, what does this mean exactly? Tell us that there is a targeted therapy, and I'm going to tell you that we don't quite know what these mRNA expression um, is telling us in terms of which pathway specifically that we should focus on just yet. And then just to cloud the picture a little bit more, there's been three series looking at genomics of lacrimal gland anocystic carcinoma, one out of Mayo Clinic, one out of MD Anderson, and one out of Baskin Palmer. And each of them has relatively small number, but with that being said, they're also showing different mutations. So the Mayo Clinic showed that um, lacrimal gland anocystic is very similar to parotid anocystic in that they're showing a rearrangement in MIB and FNIB. However, when you look at the MD Anderson series, they're showing actually the RAS or KRAS pathway being mutated. And just to make matter even more interesting, the Baskin Palmer series actually showed that a notch pathway is implicated. Now, why do we care that there are three different pathways? Because they're treated completely differently with different potential targeted therapy. So the pathway um, upstream from that or downstream from that um, has specific targets um, that may be able to be targeted. There's more and more KRAS targeted therapy that is in clinical trial, which also has an overlap with RAF and MAP kinase. Whereas the NOSH pathway is targeted completely differently with a different set of inhibitors potentially. So depending on which you think this pathway is driving anocystic, there might be completely different pathway or drugs that you may be targeting for these patients. Now, on top of that, can we use genetics to try to help us distinguish uh, potential for different um, um, tumor that's implicated. Why do we care about this? And we care about this because you may have heard a term liquid biopsy. So going beyond even fine needle aspirates, what if we don't even have to touch the tumor? So what if we can avoid biopsying the tumor altogether and then looking at people's serum or blood or maybe even tear as a way of distinguishing what tumor we're dealing with. So that's the so-called liquid biopsy or non-cellular biopsy. And in order to do that, you have to be able to figure out what you're looking for. So what um, non-cellular targets you're looking for in order to be able to do or design liquid biopsy. So one study looked at trying to distinguish the different epithelial tumors based on STAT3 or the IL-6 JAK STAT3 pathway. And it's very interesting that they show that carcinoma X pleomorphic shows a spike in phosphorylated STAT3, which is all the way on the very right there, which um, may be a potential target for us to design liquid biopsy from so that you don't need to touch the gland and you can know whether it is a carcinoma or a pleomorphic adenoma. So this is still an area that I think is very much still in bench work. Uh, it's not even ready for any um, pilot clinical study, but I think in the next 10 year, hopefully one day we can have the dream of not even having to touch the tumor and be able to figure out what the tumor actually is. So then what next? What is the actual immediate next step for us to look at? And I think um, showing you how there are three different pathways implicated, there are some interaction between this pathway, and the pathways are quite complex as you start to dive more and more into it. Um, I think it's good to leave you with this last slide, which is a general way to think about the genomics of lacrimal gland tumor. So um, this is actually something that I'm trying to get established at MSK with trying to establish, hopefully getting all three sites, mean, meaning Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, and Baskin Palmer to collaborate on looking at not only MIB and FNIB, but also looking at maybe other gene mutation that we haven't even considered. So notch being one of them, but there's also other pathway um, such as, you know, how does mTOR play into this? Because the, there's targeted for mTOR inhibitors that is currently on the market. And then looking at its interaction with microRNA and mRNA expression. And then in cases where we just really couldn't figure out, looking at whole, whole exome sequencing. So this is kind of a way for you to think about when you're looking at genetic 
analysis of a lacrimal gland, how do you go about thinking about the interaction between all of these tests that we hear on the market? You know, what is fish analysis? What is, you know, uh, next gen uh, assays versus whole exome? Is that each of these is a higher level of looking at nuances um, and things that may not be mainstream. And then you have to realize that miRNA or microRNA then impacts the expression of all three of these level of genomics. So with that, um, I'm going to leave you with a couple of summaries just to kind of sum up what we talked about. So remember that low-grade lymphoma, as well as mental cell, because they are very uh, radiosensitive, can be treated with low-dose radiation as low as four grade, and some people are even pushing the envelope to two grades. Exenteration actually does not increase survival for lacrimal gland epithelial tumors, and that globe sparing rate plus radiation has been equivalent to intraarterial plus exenteration plus chemotherapy plus radiation. So both of those are, are equivalent in terms of survival, and both of them are valid things to offer your patients. Think about in terms of genomics of lacrimal gland that microRNA expression are distinct for lacrimal gland and that we may have to think of ourselves as different than the head and neck surgeon when we're dealing with lacrimal gland tumors. Both KRAS, MIBFIB, as well as NOTCH, all three pathways which are distinct from each other has been implicated and that we may be looking at potential targets for a liquid biopsy for lacrimal gland tumor in the future. So with that, thank you very much for your patience. And I'm sorry that I went over a little bit, but at this point, I'm going to ask if anyone has any last minute questions that they want to ask me.